At the Port Macquarie Koala Hospital, dozens of animals injured in these terrible fires are being nursed back to health. Over the last few months we've seen huge improvements with a lot of our burns victims. So when they arrived they were sitting in baskets most of the time in our intensive care units. Now all of them are in outside enclosures. Most of them, I think all except one, uh, no longer have bandages and they're all showing signs of recovery which is just so positive. The habitat destruction is enormous so whole areas of forest have been burnt. Um, it's blackened and grey and when our search and rescue teams went in the, the thing that struck them most was the silence because everything was gone. This fire season and drought have pushed koalas closer towards being officially listed as endangered with estimates of up to 10,000 killed this summer alone. But Sue Ashton is heartened by the public's outpouring of support. We set up a GoFundMe account at the suggestion of a member of the public and we set as a target $25,000 and we reached $7.5 million. And the heartwarming thing about that was that lots of those donations were little, like $10 and $15, which to us meant that there was widespread endorsement and, and support for the koala. There's still hope. We would never give up hope because that's what we're here for. We're here to stop the decline of the wild koala population and that's what keeps us going. More than one billion animals are said to have died so far this fire season. 113 species have been identified as now requiring urgent help. What we found is that there are many animals on that list that were threatened before the fires and now we're even more concerned about them. But there are also animals on that list that weren't considered threatened before the fires, but because of these fires, we think that they might be now imperiled. Australian Threatened Species Commissioner Sally Box says large-scale efforts are underway to protect these vulnerable species. The first thing is to do those rapid on-ground assessments so that we know exactly what we're dealing with, what's happened to these species on the ground. The second thing that we can do is protect the unburnt habitat. The damage to plants and trees has also been extraordinary. So we're here in Namadji National Park. More than 80% of this park was burnt in the fires. But it's not just this season. This park burnt in 2003. And I was just speaking to Brett McNamara, who's the head of this park here, and he said you shouldn't see two fires like this in your lifetime. So this, the intensity and the frequency of the fires here is a, is a real concern. For 25 years, researchers have been fighting to bring this tiny flock of glossy black cockatoos that only exist on this island back from the brink of extinction. The population got down to almost 150 individuals. Since then, protecting nest trees, planting she-oak and putting up artificial nest boxes, the population had actually increased to around 400 individuals. So it had, it had more than doubled in the past 25 years. Um, and we were so excited about that prior to December. When fires ripped through the island in December, more than half of their habitat was destroyed. They only eat the seed off one type of shrub, so if there's no she-oak, there's basically no glossies. And we think we've lost about 74% of their known nest trees. So going forward, um, what we're going around is actually checking what's left, um, which is going to be a really sad job, I think, for everyone. Uh, so just slightly higher, Mike. So it's just a little bit of Is it a matter of being perhaps, you know, one or two bushfires away from losing everything in terms of the amount of sort of food they still have left? There's a huge risk if we have more fires in coming years that we could lose some species and habitats entirely. Kangaroo Island's always been this haven for so many species that are declining on the mainland. If half the refuge just disappears, I mean, this could have huge implications for a whole suite of species. Animals and plants are not all that's been affected. The long-term impacts of these fires on human health are still largely unknown. Rachel was six months pregnant when the smoke was at its worst in Canberra in January. 
it's just really challenging and really stressful. And I think like, you know, with all the hormones as well, I just could like, there was like a couple of days where I was just could not stop crying. It was awful. And, and you just, you think, oh, what can I do? What can I do? But I guess we're doing the best we can. Her data analyst partner, Shalev, was so concerned that he started putting together regular updates on the smoke to help protect her. I would start to look at um, weather patterns and smoke forecasts and kind of combine a bunch of data to figure out, OK, here's when it's going to be bad during the day, so you should definitely stay inside. Here's where it might be a little bit better. Here's when you can go out. Here's how we'll plan our, our trips or our driving or our errands. The couple eventually decided to move from Canberra to Melbourne to protect their unborn child. It got to the point where we were um, barricading ourselves in our bedroom with like sealing like the vents and like the tops and the bottoms of the doors. It's just not safe for anyone, regardless of being pregnant or not. We just booked flights the next morning and said, we cannot be here like this. It's just not safe. It's not healthy for anyone. Yeah, it's been nice to just take a walk outside without a mask. I remember that like when we first got here, we were like, wow, this is so different because it had been so long since we'd been able to do that. Well, I think it's been a great pregnancy and um, the baby is 100% okay. <laughs> we're excited to meet it. Um, but for us, it's, you know, we managed, you know, we're very grateful that we managed to dodge all the conditions that were happening. What the smoke has done to all Australians is still unknown. We've all been part of a big mass experiment on, the, on populations and I think time will tell how bad it is. Exactly what millions of Australians were breathing in this summer is still being evaluated. It's not just the particles in, in the smoke that they need to worry about. There are a lot of toxic gases like formaldehyde, acrylin, hydrogen cyanide. I could carry on naming, but quite a few. So, and the importance of the, the gas phase stuff is that you can't uh, protect yourself using a mask. OK, um, I'll step through. So this, this instrument just measures the total number of particles. Um, Atmospheric chemist Professor Claire Murphy was doing field work south of Sydney when the bushfire smoke plume drifted over and provided a whole new data set. These gases are toxic and they're known, uh, they're known to attack different parts of the human body. The reason that they're not monitored by air quality monitoring stations is that normally they would be below the detection limit of the instruments that you could easily get hold of. So in the smoke they're very elevated and you can see the concentrations quite clearly. Exclusive figures provided to 7.30 by the Australia Institute point to a growing heatwave threat, which is a major contributing factor to bushfires. The data shows that if emissions don't change, the annual number of hot days will rise substantially. For example, by 2070, Sydney may experience up to 20 days over 35 degrees, Melbourne could expect 22 and Canberra 25. The extreme bushfire days that are going to affect the young people are going to be much more frequent and much more severe. CSIRO climate scientist Professor David Caroli says the link between hotter weather and more extreme fires is indisputable. But what we're seeing is, due to human-caused climate change, that the fire danger extremes are occurring earlier in the year. We're now getting spring extreme fire danger conditions. These fires have been a tipping point for the Australian public. In an Ipsos poll conducted exclusively for 7.30, 65% of people said yes. They believe the federal government needs to change its policy on carbon emissions in the wake of the recent bushfires. In a statement to 7.30, the Prime Minister's office said, Our position is clear. We won't set new targets without being able to look Australians in the eye and tell them how we'll get there and how much those policies will cost. But some people say, oh no, we should wait. We should wait until we know the science better. We should wait until we have new technologies. But waiting is not just doing nothing. Waiting is actually making a decision to make climate change worse. Professor David Caroli says he still has hope that Australia and the world will act to solve climate change. I know what the impacts are. I also know that it's going to get much, much worse. But I also know we know what the solutions are to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and that we can fix it if we want to. But we have to choose to fix it.
The fires have also impacted drinking water supplies. Well, the short-term impacts are the impacts that happen during the fires themselves. Water treatment plants that have sustained damage from the fires. The longer-term risks, they're related to impacts to the drinking water catchments. So where fires have gone through forested areas, uh, the trees have been burnt, they've produced ash, which ends up on the ground. And when the rainfall events come along, as they have in many cases now, they will wash that ash into the waterways. Warragamba Dam here in the Blue Mountains was cut off due to contamination following the bushfires, but Sydney had other water sources it could rely on. Other water supplies across Australia are more vulnerable. We have small water treatment plants, water supplies around the country that, that are really not up to world standard in terms of catchment protection, uh, reliability, vulnerability assessment, being able to provide good quality drinking water under a range of, of different circumstances. In a survey conducted exclusively for 7.30, Stuart Khan discovered the scale of the impact across the country. From northern New South Wales, down the east coast to Gippsland in Victoria and Kangaroo Island, suppliers reported problems. We recorded a large number of actual impacts to, to water supplies. And so treatment plants that were offline, that were damaged, places that lost water for periods of time, pumping stations that lost power. And for every one of those damaged treatment plants or pumping stations, there was a dozen near misses. We need to learn from that, we need to identify what could have happened, what could have gone wrong. It could have been very much worse for, for many communities. And tomorrow night in the final part of our special bushfire series, we take a look at what the future holds for bushfire survivors. Lived in Malakuta since 1967, which is 52 years I guess. I built my own home and took seven years from the day I started till the day I finished and it took about half a day for it to disappear. Month of January, you know, we haven't earned a cent um, basically. The government's got to have a look and think that, you know, the whole east coast of Australia has taken a massive hit. Is there any government grants or government money available for businesses like yours? Not at the moment. Um, there was some, uh, there's a whole lot of hype there back a while ago. There's no real support for us. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 730's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.